Morning. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the words we heard from you this morning through Matthias. You are unfathomable. But thank you that you are still knowable in a way that we can begin to connect with you. And we ask that as we look a, a bit more at the gifting that you've given us, that that also would help us draw closer to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, in fact, as uh, I alluded to in our first session, we will be finishing things up this week. And let me tell you why. As I was going through the materials, it, uh, it became clear that I don't want to simply stretch things out. We are just scratching the surface uh, right now, but I don't want to simply say because we had four weeks on the schedule, that's what we will do. And quite honestly, the last thing that we were going to talk about is uh, asking you to consider doing a spiritual gifts inventory or survey between the third and fourth session, and then on the fourth session, spend time talking about that in the class. Well, uh, this is, what is it called? President's Day, school vacation week. And so I think uh, uh, many folk will be uh, distracted with, uh, with that during the week. And uh, you all know how to do inventories and surveys on your own. And we can talk individually about these things. So I figured we'd give you a break next Sunday before uh, the next series starts. Hello. Hi. I was praying for you when you went to Charlton months ago for your first thing. Remember that? Oh, thank you. So yes. It went well? Yes. Yes, Good. they have lifted the restrictions, so I'm back seeing them inside. Excellent. Thanks, so, Suzanne. Sorry for the detour. Um, okay, so let's start in. Last week, we looked at what the filling of the Holy Spirit means and saw that it wasn't a capacity thing. It was more uh, that of total immersion by the Spirit and in Him and uh, giving us the power in order to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. We also looked at where the gifts those various lists, lists of gifts were listed in the Bible and uh, took a look at each of those spiritual gifts plus a few more. So this week, we'll take a look at whether or not any of the spiritual gifts have stopped or ceased. Also, how should the spiritual gifts be used? And finally, how do I find out what my spiritual gifts are? Now, knowing how many uh, slides there are in this, I think we're going to have a fair time for discussion. And what we had done last year when we were doing the Holy Spirit class on Zoom is when we had discussion times at the end of each session, we would stop the recording so that folk would feel more comfortable to say whatever they have in mind without feeling recorded. So Jen and I have a signal, and she'll push the button and stop it. And uh, so that'll be the case when we get to discussion time. <clears throat> Many scholars through the ages, and this is through the ages, have believed that certain gifts were limited to the early church. They were often called the sign gifts, with the idea that those gifts were intended to be used during the establishment of the church. Tongues is one of those gifts. Uh, remember, we had that chart uh, in the first session about uh, what was the evidence of somebody being uh, receiving the Holy Spirit and also of their salvation. And tongues was one of those evidences. And that turns out that that's one of those sign gifts that we'll look at that uh, people have said uh, have stopped. During that period also, these scholars say that the purpose of those sign gifts 
was to establish the credibility of the apostles because those were the ones who exhibited those sign gifts aside from those who spoke in tongues. So those who believe that those gifts that we'll look at have stopped are often called cessationists. Those gifts have ceased. And then you have the non-cessationists, which I think I've alluded to. I tend to fall into that camp. But those gifts include healing, miracle, prophecy. And this is prophecy in the sense of revealing the future as opposed to speaking boldly, boldly and fearlessly about the gospel and God's truth. Remember we said that many have said that Billy Graham is a modern-day prophet. Uh, those who speak God's word boldly and uh, fearlessly can be called prophets, as the prophets did. Tongues, and then the interpretation of tongues. And again, we have apostle in italics because uh, with the capital A, we're saying that uh, those who were in Christ's presence, heard from him directly, and were sent directly by him, get the capital A. But there is a sense of we're all apostles. Uh, John MacArthur says that uh, the commissioning of the Twelve uh, had the sense of them being ambassadors for Christ. And if you recall in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, we're told that we are all ambassadors for Christ as if God is speaking through us. So in some sense, we all are little A apostles. We've all been sent by God to uh, be the sweet uh, fragrance of his aroma in every place. <clears throat> Now, one of the reasons that I fall into the non-cessationist, even though I am not a scholar in Bible things, and so I'm going at odds with people who have studied this a lot, is when certain believers manifest the gifts that they have said have ceased. What do I do with that? One could argue that those who are exhibiting these gifts are not under God's influence and are trying to gain glory for themselves. That would be one conclusion. If those gifts have ceased and somebody is manifesting the gift, where are they getting the power to heal somebody or to perform a miracle? Now, we know over the years there's been no shortage of people trying to make a living by preying on needy people. Mateo Sacampo today in his message alluded to one such group. Uh, we've seen that on TV and various other things. Let me read uh, 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. It's not surprising that some people, we've been told this 2,000 years ago, that that can be uh, the way some people will behave and try to distort the truth. Now, in, uh, there are a couple more, a few more points here, but before I go on, I wanted to say that in all of this, because there are opposing points of view, don't just believe what I say. Be a Berean. Remember in Acts 17, 10 through 12, Paul, maybe with Silas, but with uh, a, a band of folk were in uh, Thessalonica, and they got run out of town. And so they go to Berea. So as soon as it was night, the believers in Thessalonica sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And here we go. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So this is my take on these things. I am not the sole purveyor of all truth. So if it's not your take on them, check it out. 
and uh, check the scriptures. What was that um, scripture? That is Acts 17, 10 through 12. And as far as certain miracles and tongues being done, uh, my mother was healed at a healing service of rheumatoid arthritis. Mm. It happened like this, and it was for good. It wasn't an emotional response uh, or anything like that. The one who had this gift of healing, in the process of using it, was giving glory to God, not to his own special abilities. And I think that's one of the key discriminators. Who's getting the glory from the manifestation of these miracles? Is it God or the person? In regard, I love this thing. A friend of mine told me this account that uh, he had seen in an interview regarding healing services in other African countries. Uh, this was a pastor who has a gift of healing, ministers in Africa, and the services are huge, and people are being healed from all sorts of things. So he was asked by an American why he thought we don't see such, mir such miracles as often in this country. And the pastor replied, that is because in his congregation, they haven't yet been taught that God no longer does miracles of healing. <laughs> and that reminded me of Jesus saying in Matthew 13, 53 to 58, and I'll read it just like it is. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he be began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? They asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't, isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Now, some very mature Christians who I know speak in tongues. What do I say about that? Uh, so, uh, that's, that's the problem I run into when I think of the cessationist things. Now, when I read their arguments, I can see where they may be coming from. But it doesn't square with the experience. Now, they would say that the word of God, not your experience is what we go on. But I think that there are some vagaries in those passages which they use which would make me say that seeing God at work now might point us into which way those vagaries might lead us to. So, uh, that's it. And I told you about giving glory to God. What about private prayer languages? <clears throat> we talked about this a bit last week. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, which ended up with uh, you need to interpret. And if you don't have somebody who interprets, don't use your gift in the congregation. And everything should be done orderly in an in uh, orderly manner in the services. But Paul said uh, that he wished everybody could speak in tongues as he does. And he talked about heavenly languages and his spirit being uplifted, but those around him with no interpreter could easily think that he's a madman. doesn't make any sense. So he said, I'd rather people prophesy in the sense of proclaiming God's word rather than uh, speak 10,000 words in a tongue so that everybody could benefit and the uh, unbelievers could hear God's word. So the sum of all that is that there may be private prayer languages, I wouldn't be surprised, that there seems to be a manner in which gifts should be used out in the open in the congregation. Uh, and I can't say that these people are, are faking it. I don't know that. So I've said all this already, but I'll read it. Right here. My belief is that all these gifts continue. However, the spirit of the one exercising the gifts needs to be tested to ensure that the gifts are true and are being demonstrated by the power of the Holy Spirit for God's glory 
and the building up of the body of Christ. So that brings us to how should we use our spiritual gifts? And I don't, I've never seen spiritual gift envy in the next thing that I'm going to talk about. So it could be that this is brand new to humanity. <laughs> Nobody has ever thought of this before. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 to 17. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, this would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. In our culture, I think, in particular, we tend to be wowed by people who are up front. And God is far less wowed by that. And uh, because of the response that we have, there may be a sense that we would want to be like that person. I would love to be able to teach like Tom or Donna or Mateus. But that isn't the gifting that I've been done. I can't lead a congregation in that way. We may like the attention. But that can also lead to thinking that a less visible gift is not as desirable. Well, this person has the gift of service, and I never see them, but everything always runs so well on a Sunday morning. But who does that? You know, the old lady who was praying for the pastor that we talked about last week. So what is spiritual gift detraction? 1 Corinthians 12, 19 to 27 says this. Okay, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater glory to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is just so like what Jesus would say. Uh, you come up here. He who is humbled will be exalted. He who is exalted will be humbled. So, with this in mind, we have to talk about sphincters. Okay? And I'll ask Brandon, but I won't put you on the spot, really. <laughs> shrink. Since, since, but you have a medical thing. So I said, shrink. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you say, how many sphincters does a body have? I looked it up. A search will say between four and 60. Four and 60. You never know they're working until they don't. I have a friend who, uh, who was born with a sphincter problem at his stomach. And so he'd be walking around and he'd, erp, he'd throw up a little bit and then swallow. And, it, and this went, that was his life. That's the way he was going to live his life. I don't know if surgeries have been done to help that. Uh, but I would guarantee that if that started happening to us, we would all know that, gee, that sphincter was pretty valuable. That woman who was praying every night for that pastor was really valuable to the ministry of that church. Okay, move on. 
we shouldn't say that gifts which are weaker are not needed. More abundant honor on those which we think in our culture are less honorable. This I love. There should be no division in the body. This is a unit. Uh, the members should have the same care for one another. And then, if one member suffers, the others suffer with it. One honor, the others rejoice with it. I mean, Paul said this also in Romans. Is it in Romans 15 or somewhere around there? Uh, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Uh, that is a principle that we should keep in mind. But one of my favorite verses from this 1 Corinthians 12 passage are 11 and 18. 11 says, all these are empowered, all these gifts, by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And 18 says, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. It's God's business. And like we heard in the message again today, the potter and the clay, who are we to say to God, why did you make me, make me this way? We should rejoice with the gifting, about the gifting that we have, uh, rather than potentially envy or look down on uh, people with different gifts. So, with this, we then make a transition into the next chapter in 1 Corinthians which I call a continuation of chapter 12. And Paul goes on to talk more about spiritual gifts in chapter 13. Without love, he says, all of these gifts are worthless. I think it would be helpful for us, it was in preparing for this helpful for me, to start thinking of 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 is a chapter where chapter 12 tells us what the gifts are and chapter 13 tells us how to use the gifts. We shouldn't think of them as the gifts chapter and the love chapter. If we look at the gifts that Paul mentions in the first three verses of chapter 13, their tongues, prophecy, knowledge, faith, and giving. And he says that if you exercise any of these to whatever level, if you don't do it with love, it's worth nothing. And as a matter of fact, in verse 8, Paul says that prophecy, tongues, knowledge will be done away with. Now this actually is one of the verses that those who feel certain gifts end uh, talk about prophecy tongues uh, stopping. I have always, in reading this, thought that, yes, in the last days, there won't be a need for those, as opposed to at the end of the establishment of the church. And uh, that's just my take on it. They are given for a season while the church exists, until we are fully mature in Christ. So, very short thing on how to use the gifts. So, here we are, the climax of these sessions. How do I find my gifts? Pray, pray. Why do you say pray? Everybody always says pray. That's the solution to everything. <laughs> but it's true. That's our starting point. It isn't a big mystery how to find our gifts. Because the important things in our spiritual life, God doesn't make into a big mystery. He makes them very plain so that everybody can participate in his body in a special way. Remember that a spiritual gift could be a natural ability that you were born with. And, of course, a natural ability we're born with is given by God. 
that then the Holy Spirit energizes in such a way that it serves the body well. Or it could be a special ability that you're given when you become a Christian. Hey, I didn't used to be able to touch somebody and his cancer went away. How did that happen? Uh, that's not generally an innate ability. And so it could be a special ability at salvation that God has given. So in this prayer process, I would recommend asking God for a pure heart. Why is it that I want to find out my gifts? What am I going to do with them? And then also to avoid the potential pitfalls of gift envy or gift attraction. I think I have a gift of evangelism because those guys really get a lot of attention when they have success. Something we would want to avoid. And then asking others who know you well what your spiritual gifts might be. I think this is a really fundamental step. People may say, I can't get over how welcome people feel around you. Uh, you are always inviting people over. When they leave there, they feel enriched and blessed. I would think that you might have a gift of hospitality. You may want to check that out. And uh, that kind of feedback would be very helpful. And then, of course, we're in America, so there's got to be a survey, an instrument, something like that. <laughs> we read a book, and we're an expert on everything on that topic. We mentioned two last week. One was that Wagner modified house questionnaire. You can just put that into your search engine, and you'll come up with a bunch of links. Usually it's a PDF file. You can download it. Typically it's 14 pages long. We looked at it. Uh, there are 125 questions. And uh, the basic gist there is that through looking at what your interests, strengths, demonstrated abilities are, uh, you uh, answer the questions and it says, well, these are the things that rise to the top with people who prefer these things. And then the Your Gifts is the title of it by Dr. Larry Gilbert. And you can purchase those online too. They're about $8. Uh, and as we said, going through the list of gifts last week, uh, they focus on nine specific gifts that can be used to uh, help the body uh, the, in, in church ministry excel. And I'm sure there are others. Dolores was doing searches a couple years ago, and I think she came across a couple others too. These are the ones that we're familiar with. The house questionnaire is very nice, and I didn't look at the Gilbert one deeply enough, but they say these are suggestions. These are possibilities. This isn't who you are very much. I'm not that familiar with psychological profiles. I'm familiar with Myers-Briggs, and they say that too. You are not this. You prefer to do this. Uh, and your tendencies are this way. What do you think, as you pray, as you talk with people, what do you think you're being led by God to do, and which gifts would that require? I really love going overseas or to Appalachia or somewhere away from my home which uh, allows me to meet new people, do things for them, and share the gospel. Well, you might have a missionary gift. It's possible. Check that out with people. As you go through these, this gift survey, if you choose to do that, talk with those who know you well and say, I'm thinking, what do you think about these results? Does that match up with what you know of me and what I do? What results have you seen when exercising what you think is a spiritual gift that you have? Uh, if people uh, always turn down your 
invitations for hospitality. Maybe that would be something that you're not particularly gifted in. Uh, or if, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so you, could, you get the idea. What kind of results have you seen from exercising that? If this is really Holy Spirit energized, we will begin to see results that come from uh, our use of these gifts. Okay, and then application. Find your gifts and use them. Uh, it'll be useful, and I've talked with Adam and Jen, which at some point, I, I don't know how you would fit it in, but the possibility of taking a list of all the ministries, making a matrix, Engineers love matrices. <laughs> and say, what spiritual gifts would be useful in those ministries? Then you can look and see, well, I have the, the gift of X, and these seven ministries need that gift. Go to leaders of those ministries and say, how can I be pressed into service? Remember that uh, verse in First Peter. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Uh, having these gifts brings some responsibility to us in that we have a stewardship to properly use them because they've been given not for our edification but for the edification of the church and the building up of the body. Ah, I just said that. <laughs> And I just said that. <laughs> okay, the church is indeed a place to be fed, but it's also a place to serve and build up the body of Christ. I think so much in our culture, we have this consumer mentality. A pastor doesn't have a specific gift of preaching that's really enjoyable. I don't get much from a sermon, so I'm not going to go there. Well, what about using your gifts in that body? Uh, and if we approach church in that way, how can we go to church to serve as opposed to be served? Uh, that might help bring these gifts to the, the surface too, let them percolate. We need both. We need to be fed both from the word and the fellowship in the church, but we also need to serve. And uh, Ephesians 4.12, the reason for the gifts is for the equipping of the saints to the building up of the body of Christ. So, brief summary of what we have done. The first week we looked at, uh, and we crammed in the whole prior course in 35 minutes, mm -hmm. on the Holy Spirit, who he is and what he does. We've looked at what are spiritual gifts. They can be natural, energized by God, or something given at salvation. Why were they? We just looked at that verse. Where can I find them? What are they? 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4 are the four major places that we see the spiritual gifts listed. What are they? And we took a lot of time last week to go over each, I think, 24 different gifts to see where they are in Scripture and look at some Scriptures that show those gifts being used. Today we talked about whether or not any spiritual gifts have ceased. I've given you my take, and you all are to be Bereans, uh, but I don't think that they have. How should they be used? And finally, how do I find out what my spiritual gifts are? And an application. Pretty brief, pretty easy.